without capitalism, who are the capitalists? As if we understand that there are only a few people who own and control the means of production in the society, then we begin to understand that there are a few capitalists. And these capitalists exploit everybody because everybody works for them. Everybody sells their labor to them. It is by selling your labor to a capitalist that he's really able to exploit you. Instead of going through theories, let me give some direct example. Let's say that I'm a capitalist. And let's say that I, I sell shirts. I sell shirts. I sell shirts. I have a shirt factory. Let's say this is my factory. I own it. The machinery. I have a place where I get cotton. Now, I own it. I'm the capitalist. And let's say you are my workers. You are my workers. You don't know me. You never see me. You see my lackeys, you know, maybe my foreman, but you never see me. Now, let's say it costs me 50 cents for cotton for every shirt I make. And let's say it costs me 50 cents for upkeep of my machinery. That's a dollar. And let's suppose I pay you a dollar for every shirt you make. That means it costs me two dollars to get a shirt, labor included, your labor. I pay you for making the shirt. Now, when I sell the shirt, being a capitalist, and you must know something about capitalism, very important. The sole motivating force, the sole motivating force in a capitalist society is profit. Profit. That is the sole motivating force. Profit. Get money. Get it. Get it as fast as you can. Get it any way you can, but get it. Just get it. And that is Kwame Ture. I believe he was still Stokely Carmichael at that time that that was uh, that clip was taken. Thank you guys, and welcome to this is Revolution coming at you all the way live from Oakland, California. I'm going to introduce my co-host, my homie, my dog. You know him as Pascal Robert of Black Agenda Report. I know him as my dog, Pascal Robert. Brother Jason, what's going on, brother? How you living, man? I'm doing all right. I'm excited for tonight. Um, I've been watching our guest and jumping in his chat from time to time on his show. I mix what I like. I've actually put links in the description for the show. Uh, he also has a, a book that our guest <laughs> uh, last Saturday, Napoleon the Legend, had hit me up after the show. He goes, "Hey man, this is Jared Ballcat. Where can I find this show with him and uh him and Killer Mike?" And I sent him the show. He's like, "Hey man, where can I find this book?" <laughs> so he he got the book and read it. Was was very excited about it. So our guest tonight, you uh, his name is Jared Ball, Professor Jared Ball. Uh, he has written a wonderful book that there's again there's a link to in the description of this show called "The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power." Please welcome Professor at Morgan State University, Jared Ball. Wow. <laughs> what's good? What's up, good people? I appreciate that. That's a, a very warm uh, 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 and, and overdone welcome and introduction, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hey, and I, I really do. I check out your show whenever I have uh, a chance. I'm, yeah, I appreciate you. I see you. Um, and I, I like I like a lot of the work that you do. And um, I'm not I'm not being funny. Napoleon, our guest, uh, Napoleon, the legend. I don't know if you if you know him. He's a he's a hip hop artist uh, from your neck of the woods, I believe. That's right. Um, now he lives overseas and he hits me up yeah, like right. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. hits me up. He's like, hey, man, uh, where can I get that uh, Jared Ball? <laughs> Talking about Killer Mike thing. I sent him a link, man, and he went and got the book and gobbled it up and was, was pretty stoked about it. So you have a you have a new fan. No, I appreciate that. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and Jared, I've been a, a long time admired your work for a while. Appeared on, as I told you earlier, on your, this mm -hmm. is um, the real news at one point. Uh, you know, uh, I've also read when you were still writing for Black Agenda Report, some of your work there, familiar with the book. I think you might have read some of my writing there as mm -hmm. well. We were both uh, good friends with uh, the late comrade and good brother Bruce Dixon, you know, yeah, man. Who, you know who was uh, very important to a lot, a lot of people, 
you know, you know, you know, Bruce's voice is needed in these times, man. No doubt. But, uh, yeah. Thanks for raising him up too, man. Yeah. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. But, um, we got some questions here and, uh, we want to celebrate your work and we want to celebrate the importance of what you're doing in terms of bringing black left clarity to the, the, uh, r ridiculous situation we have politically in the country that we have right now, man. And, uh, that, that is very important. And we're going to get into as much as possible. So I'm just going to go straight to the questions and let's just get direct. Sure, so Jared, sure. in 2020, you published your book, The Myths and Propaganda of Black Buy Buying Power. Can you share with our audience what inspired you to write this book? And what exactly is the myth of black buying power? Where it originate from? Who are the acolytes of using this framing? And why is this framing so popular amongst promoters of black capitalism as a key to black liberation? Yeah, no, again, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, well, you know, I wanted to write it because, uh, you know, I've been as well, as I always say, you know, starting just in, in activist organizations in, uh, in, in some very, uh, you know, wonderfully militant and left of everything, get, you know, uh, formations uh, from those to all, you know, any other, uh, you know, in, in the black uh, political uh, public sphere. There were always these, you know, even among some very radical presentations and discussions, there was always this this uh, refrain of buying power. Uh, so when I, uh, you know, and it, but it never, it, it never sat well, it never seemed to make sense. And it didn't even seem to, to jive with some of the data and reporting that was even being brought up by the same people presenting the myth. Uh, so when I started, as you mentioned, working with Black Agenda Report, however, whenever many years, ago, actually, as it first started, um, uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to to try to cover. Uh, and so just, you know, just starting to routinely look at it, I just started seeing this pattern. And, and then, you know, uh, uh, so many, many years later, uh, a decade or so later, when I finally, you know, took a moment, uh, had a moment to try to put the book together uh, and and learn a few more things, it became kind of clear that that one of the problems is that, as you mentioned, across the political spectrum of of, of uh, you know of, of black life, people have adopted or adapted the the the, the concept, uh, and then once it sort of got organized and produced in the early twentieth century, and then re you know, sort of weaponized by the black commercial press in the middle of the 20th century. And then sort of, you know, I don't know what's the, you know, uh, hyper weaponized by the Nixon administration. Uh, it's, it's been promoted, uh, you know, a marketing and advertising concept has been uh, promoted and misreported and uh, uh, poorly analyzed uh, as economic strength. And, uh, you know, intentionally, uh, as I'm trying to argue, to move us away from what is the only strength we've ever had, which is organized political movement and attempts to assume political power, which is the, 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 the ultimate goal of really all the propaganda or psychological warfare that's targeting everybody in this country uh, and beyond. But is uh, in this instance, uh, particularly, you know, uh, and viciously targeting uh, black people here. Uh, and then the last point I I, I, I mentioned in the book, but I, I kind of think I, I want to highlight even more now, uh, given this particular political climate that I think you mentioned, um, is that just as has always been the case from the perspective of empire, uh, white supremacy and, and European you know, uh, uh, colonialism, uh, the marketing data that that assesses or claims to assess back buying power does so in a very pan-African way, and it includes all of the activity of African descended people in this country. Uh, so they do not differentiate between continental Africans uh, uh, who have uh, migrated here uh, more recently, uh, or those of us who uh, descend from those enslaved previously, or those who have some sort of combination thereof. Uh, all of us are accounted. Uh, uh, and by the way, they don't differentiate between uh, supposed uh, um, uh, mixed race uh, uh, populations either. Uh, so it's the entire black community that is assessed. And even with all included, it is a horrific economic condition that we find ourselves in. So 
anyway, so I just wanted to try to, to, to try pierce through some of the mythology that I think uh, does get to some of the more important and bigger issues uh, that this one smaller subset of the problem uh, reveals once you start to, you know, peel it, peel back the label or whatever, so to speak. So do you want to elaborate for our audience in terms of why this framing or this particular means of analyzing black economic power or activity is faulty or problematic? In other words, do you want to give us a, a brief summation of the argument as to why this is a bad way as to look at the black, black people overall? Sure. Well, well, the thing that, and again, uh, for reasons we can come back to at some point, if anyone likes, uh, I don't put this in the book. I don't start here, but, but the, but the real problem is, is that wealth is not created through the establishment of small business, et cetera. It's, it's created through, uh, colonial, uh, and military conquest. Uh, that's the first step towards wealth, uh, suppressing targeted populations and stealing their land and ultimately their productive, uh, capacities. Uh, but beyond that, you know, uh, essentially what I'm arguing is that, which is really a, an extension of this, or, or that is an extension of this, is that um, the issue is public policy. It's political power. Uh, the, that's how wealth is created. It is uh, by uh, uh, extracting wealth from land and labor, redistributing it through the global uh capitalist, um, you know, economy and bringing back returns. Uh, but ultimately it's this issue of public policy. It's politics. It's, it's not an issue of starting a small business or, or spending your money wet wisely or quote unquote, having financial literacy or any of that. None of that is, is, is what's involved here. It is, uh, uh wealth, how it's created, who gets it, uh, how it's defined. All of that is, is determined by public policy. So, uh, and when, when we are encouraged away from that, we are by, you know, for instance, being told, you know, you got to get your money right before you get your politics, right. No. That's the exact opposite. It is the exact opposite. And we saw that in full display last summer when the elite who were going to lose, uh, the wealth that they were counting on from our, uh, general consumption, everybody's general consumption during a crisis, they just created money out of nowhere and gave it to themselves with the hope and cares act. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and said, you know, what, you know, I mean, and kept on moving. And that's why everybody at the top is doing quite well right now. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Bezos is maybe the most famous among them, uh, but his whole class is doing quite well. And, uh, you know, and, the, and everyone else on the descending scale is, is not. Excellent. Excellent. So. Can you elaborate about how this co this content this con content comparison by black capitalists about how the number of times a dollar circulates in the black community oh. compared to other ethnic groups is based on weak intellectual foundation? You know the whole the whole argument that people have is that a dollar circulates you know five hundred times in the you know in the Jewish community or the Korean community and it only circulates one point two times in the black community and that's the problem. Can you elaborate on your argument as to why that's an absolutely intellectually fallacious way of talking about wealth creation? Well, one, again, I, and I admit this, you know, happily, I am not a so-called trained economist, but uh, in, in nowhere in any of the data or reports or books or anything that I've ever read or researched has this circulation of the dollar been... Uh, discussed by anybody as a uh, as real number one so one i don't know where the the claims even come from and they're rarely sourced uh in in you know even the literature many of us grew up and and continue to respect and love it's not really sourced uh as a claim um but again nobody points to this as a way wealth is created uh, and one of the, the things that I, I, I picked up from uh, uh, Marissa Baradaran's work, uh, uh, great book, which I think, yeah, it is a great book uh, and is way more expansive on many of these issues than mine. But she points out that you can seg segregate people, but you cannot segregate money. And that was sort of the point I was getting at at the beginning. Wealth is not created by circulating wealth uh, with, among any population, even the wealthiest, never mind circulating wealth, uh, circulating uh, you know, money that is among colonized, wildly ex you know, exploited poor populations. That's not how wealth is created. Wealth is created by putting it out 
into to to the global economy, uh, investing and in, in getting all you know and doing you know making it work for you and all that kind of stuff, as they say. That's how that's how wealth is created. You know the 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 way you keep people poor is to propagandize them to say, you know, just you just stay in your local communities and set up some small businesses and banks and circulate your money amongst yourselves. It just does not make any, you know, it's not, it's not logical, but uh, one of the problems that, you know, as I'm sure we'll get to that, that uh, allows all of these myths, not, you know, not the least of which buying power to, to proliferate is that, uh, you, you know, a lot of facts are not checked. A lot of sources are not referenced, uh, you know, and, and, you know, so, so people don't realize that a lot of these claims don't have any basis in fact or data. Uh, or uh, as is the case with buying power, they have literally one source uh, that is itself wildly flawed. So, I mean, uh, you know, uh, anyway, so that would be my, that's, you know, my quick or quickest response to that, to that claim. Anything you want to add? No, 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 no. I was actually kind of moving out of the way for you guys. This is like a reunion of Black Agenda Report and the real news and a lot of other things. So I was letting the OGs talk for a second. So, so listen, Jared, let me ask you. Can you explain how the Black buying power mythology is premised on assuming that the exploitive and oppressive condition of working class and poor Black people in America, that find that Black people, and Black poor people and working class people find themselves is a consequence of their own failings as opposed to being rooted in the political economy of capitalism. In other words, one of the, the major kind of uh, talking points of those people who use this terminology, and we know who they are in the black community. If we want to get really grimy, we can name names, but maybe we want to be diplomatic today. I don't know, it depends on my mood, I might do that. But who want to argue that, you know, you know, it's the it's it's the inability of black people to do X Y Z and A B C that they're in this condition. Can you uh, elaborate on you know basically the origins of this and how this goes back to the, the the recycled notion that black people are somehow defective, broken, or the the cause of their own demise economically and otherwise? Yeah, I, I you know for me at least I don't I don't know that I I, I point to a singular specific uh, you know point of origin for any of this. I just try to highlight some key moments in the development of these myths, particularly as they relate to to black people here. Uh, but um, uh, the, the first of all, the overall goal, uh, you know, one of those points uh, in the post Second World War moment was to create using propaganda, which is better understood, I think, as psychological warfare, um, it, you know, to, to, uh, to promote the United States uh, and capitalism as the singular model for how the world should work with, of course, the United States running it. Uh, an obvious component of that would be to say that you can't have, you know, your capitalist economic model um, that you want to promote to the world as as a singular success, uh, something that uh, can be pointed to as what is causing all of the inequality that still exists. So you you do the exact opposite. You point you you use it as as a way to promote uh, the mythology that no, it's through capitalism that you close gaps in inequality and you give people opportunity. So, uh, and that's again where I try to point to how the black commercial press got involved and took up that opportunity that was being offered them by the the state, so to speak, and and said, sure. In exchange for some of your ad revenue, <laughs> uh, we'll turn over uh, our black audience to you and tell them and everyone uh, uh, that America is great and, you know, we don't want to be, you know, revolutionaries it, we, and, or even civil rights strugglers. We just want uh, uh, to be able to shop and live a middle class lifestyle and we'll buy your products, you know, um, in, in the process. Uh, and then the flip side is, sure, we, we you know, the elite want to be able to say, um uh, even the formerly enslaved and the you know the 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 currently colonized can overcome all of that if they just you know shop and become good middle class citizens and 
you know, enjoy this, this, the wonders of the capitalist economy. So you have, you can't have a situation where that's being uh, criticized or condemned uh, as being part of the problem. So uh, anyway, that's, that's the, the shortest version of, of why I think this, this proliferates. And then of course you have um, uh, a handful of black spokespeople who are, you know, well-placed and well-paid to, to promote it. Uh, and sometimes I think it's done willingly and disingenuously. And sometimes I think uh, others legitimately believe that this is uh, the way out. Uh, and, you know, and it's sometimes for me, at least it's hard to assess exactly which, which, you know, where it's coming from. So I just try to stay focused on the argument and say, nope, nope, nope. Uh, and the historical record is pretty clear that not only can this not work, uh, but it's been designed and and uh, encouraged specifically uh, to target, uh, you know, the the psyche of uh, and really, and I keep coming back to this, you know, and 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 I think I saw uh, um, big puns, uh, uh, brother Silberg in the in the audience, but I keep talking about this this book that is still new to me, uh, Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley, which I think he properly resets our what should be our approach to this, and even beyond just psychological warfare. Our entire media environment was created specifically to suppress counterinsurgency uh, efforts uh, among colonized populations, not only among those uh, outside the U.S., but those in the United States and specifically black people here. So I think it's it's we could we could use the euphemisms of entertainment and uh, news or journalism or advertising, marketing, branding, et cetera, and so on and so on and so forth. But really, it's it's counterinsurgency, psychological warfare uh, meant to make sure we don't ever try to become uh, politically engaged in ways we're not supposed to be. Uh, You're talking about surveillance capitalism that uh, surveillance valley. No, I'm talking about there, 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 no. So there's there, both books I would recommend. Uh -huh. Uh, surveillance capitalism is, uh, um, uh, um, I'm forgetting her name, the Harvard professor. Um, Shoshana Zuboff. That's it. it yeah. An incredibly important book. But no, I'm talking about Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley. Mm -hmm. And I'm forgetting the subtitle, but it's about the, the um, really the military. It, it's, it goes beyond, he even mentioned, not me, he doesn't mention me specifically, but the group of people that I would count myself to be a part of that, mm -hmm that have not gone far enough, even in, when in our own work, we pointed to the military origins of the internet and even have talked about it. We didn't go far enough. So when you Darpanet. read this book, yeah. oh, I mean, but, but, but it's way, anyway, my point is it's way deeper than that and way mm -hmm. bigger than that and way more conscious than that in terms of the development of the media environment we have now, which they didn't obviously back 50, 60 years ago know fully how it was going to look, mm -hmm. but their intent was that we have exactly what we have now, not to make it easier for us to even do what we're doing here, but to make it easier for us to be put under surveillance, but specifically to limit our potential to become counterinsurgents with, it, it, you know, uh, uh, um, and potential threats politically. Uh, uh, and you know, so, so that is, I, I think the better way to really interpret what we're talking about here. Um, uh, even, even something as quote unquote simple as, as buying power. Hmm. What you got to say about that, Pascal? This is, I think it's a book I need to read. I don't even have to say about it. I mean, it's a book I should check out. Yeah, if, I, if you can find a link to it, Jason. Maybe you can put up in the, in the comments. <laughs> no, no, somebody, somebody put it up. Uh, yeah, somebody, somebody put up uh, a link. I was actually on a show with uh, with the uh, Shoshana Zuboff, actually mm. talking about um, the heavy hand of censorship with these with these internet platforms that were that are becoming bigger than than just simple small social media platforms, right? Mm -hmm. Pascal? Yes, so we are moving on. Recently, I didn't want to ask I didn't want to ask a side question that is definitely going to derail the conversation and I don't care. My show. Then why did you, uh, why did you mention my name, fool? Why did you just ask the question? Cuz I, I can do that too. Uh Frostburg, Maryland. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I haven't seen the name of that city in at least what, what years is 2021 like eight years. I played a show in Frostburg, Maryland. 
Oh, wow. I think the name of the place is Dante's? There, yeah. If I'm not, yeah, I think I think that's one of the spots. At I, least, I, at least. There wasn't much in, in the spot because we went and played a show there, and then I think we played in, like, West Virginia afterwards. So when I saw that you were, I was like, oh, huh. And let me the say one. <laughs> let me say something uh-huh. about Frostburg real quick. It had between 1997 and 1999 in Western Maryland, the greatest funk band history has ever known. Mama's Biscuits. Cause ain't nothing wow. better than Mama's Biscuits. <laughs> and your boy with a full head of hair and probably a good 50 pounds on him <laughs> was, your, was the drummer. And for those couple of years, we did our thing. Uh, we kept the funk alive, uh, uh, and I'm very proud of that. So, so, so I'm 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 glad to hear you were gigging up there a little bit. I was gigging and, up there, and and uh, uh, and yeah. So, and by the way, and I always like to rem- let everybody know that, that 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 I came up with the name for the band at, at, um, listening to uh, the Muddy Waters album, mm. Red Man and Method Man, and Method Man oh, has a verse album. on there. Okay. That album, yeah. That album, that Muddy Waters album. That was a great album. And where, where Red, Meth Man has that verse where he says something like, "We something, something, we bomb killing, I might know but not telling. Something, something, somebody says, better than your mama's biscuits was the verse. And I, and I heard that and I said, that has got to be the name of our band. <laughs> because when you hear that, nothing is better than mama's biscuits. And it just makes you feel good and funky and soulful as soon as you hear it. And anyway, so... Anyway, there was so a, shout there was out a, to Frostburg. Yeah. There was a music scene there that and was shout more... out to drummers. That's right, Charles. That's right. <laughs> give, give the drummer some. You know what I'm saying? Always give the drummer some. Yes, indeed. I, I was, it was a jam band kind of spot, and I don't know why they booked this. I definitely was not playing that style of music when I was there, uh, but I was welcomed with open arms. Uh, and when I saw that you were in Frostburg for a time, I do remember that there was a school around there. Mm-hmm. I was like, a lot of good parties, a lot of good liquor, a lot of good weed. So all the things you need for good music scene, you know, was was all there. So I'm not surprised that 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 they would have found you, that Frostburg <laughs> would have found you and brought you through. And I'm not surprised you would have had a good time. I had a great time in Frostburg. Yeah. I have nothing bad to say about it. I just wanted to bring it up. I was like, this mm-hmm. brother was in Frostburg. Okay. I was. We got to talk about this for five minutes. Five good minutes on Frostburg. Shout out to Frostburg. And no, I and shout not- out to to not only Mama's Biscuits but Dr. Jean Marie McCong, and and who who put me on to to check check into Jump. That's where I got put on oh. to check into Jump. Okay. Now, I always remember that. Shout out to him for that too. A lot of other good memories up there, by the way, too. But that's that's a good one. I'll leave it. I'll leave that there anyway. All right, all right. The great uh, Senegalese uh, scholar, African origins no and civilization. Yep, shake on the deal. Yep. We have to have we have to have a left a black left podcast jam. <laughs> yeah. If you if you didn't know already, Jason, based on the the equipment in the back, Jason is a he- heavy metal guitarist. You know, guitarist overall. So you know, he always talks about his touring experiences and whatnot. So you now being a drummer. We're gonna start moving to whole this show. Sh- be- this show started as a music show. Mm. I told my band I was like, we could do this while we while we're not touring, and they thought I was stupid. And so now I'm the only Whoops. one. Whoops! You looking like a genius. <laughs> uh, looking like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know. Little did they know. Pascal. All right, Mo- moving on. Moving yeah. on. So, Jared, recently you've had an exchange with rapper Killer Mike after illustrating his attempt to start his Greenwood Bank that was heavily challenged by you on your program. Can you address why this strategy of black banking and buying black is a problematic vehicle for so-called black liberation? And particularly your thoughts on Killer Mike and his enterprise using that as a quote unquote liberation technique. Give us the inside skinny on the Jared Ball Killer Mike fracas. So, first of all, I always forget to mention this, but but um, uh, the chapter in my book on on uh, black banking starts is is titled "Instead They Got a Bank," and because the the publisher sort of late in the game 
told me that the epigraphs couldn't go in the book. Uh, the the quote from where that title comes, which is Marissa Baradaran's book, uh, kind of it, it got lost. So the title doesn't doesn't hit like it was. I wanted it to hit, but the point was, uh, as she talks about that, essentially, um, uh, you know, essentially, black people wanted liberation, and instead they got a bank. Uh, and because you know, and I, and I you know leaned heavily on her work uh, as well as some others, and then she and I was you got a shout out uh, Professor Nathan Connolly at, at Hopkins, put me on to uh, sort of a tradition. You know, so I'm I'm more familiar with the black radical tradition or the the tradition of radical blackness. Shout out to Dr. CBS, um, but but um, I'm not as familiar with the, the the tradition of you know sort of black mainstream or conservative economists who have also for a long time pointed out that black capitalism and black banking in particular don't work uh, because. Uh, well, I mean, the simple part is banks don't are not here to create wealth for uh, communities. They're here to create wealth for owners, uh, stock, you know, you know, major investors, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, there, you know, and if we go really back, you know, to to some, you know, you know what, you know what Lenin, you know, talked about accurately. I mean, they're they're the conduits of imperialism, really. So, I mean, they're not they're not here. Uh, but but you know but even mainstream or conservative black economists pointed out you know uh, Andrew Brimmer is the one that name that comes to my mind was 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 saying that you know um, he, and basically he's like I'm you know I'm not I'm putting words in his mouth here but he's like he's like I'm not some radical I'm not a Marxist I'm not a socialist I'm not a nationalist I'm I'm none of the above I'm just a good American black man and even as such as an honest harvard trained you know good american black man you know this econ- economic claim you know this 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 push you want from our group my people isn't is is fake isn't going to work uh so i have to say so so my point is is that everybody knows that banking is not a way to create wealth for entire communities um and honestly you know i mentioned killer mike briefly in my book uh, uh along with jay-z and others just to talk a little bit about how celebrity and pop culture plays a role in promoting this uh and yeah we did have a more recent exchange which I'll, i will quickly get into but i'm more interested in the exchange i had that is in the book uh that initially took place on my my, my, my brother net for freeman's uh voices with vision radio show some years ago with with uh, 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 um, uh, brother Mitchell, who owns or was, is, is the CEO of Industrial Bank uh, here down the road here in D.C., uh, a black owned bank where he he completely seemed willfully or unintentionally unaware of how any of this stuff works, which as the head of a bank, I would think he should where he didn't understand the concept of buying power, GDP. Uh, wealth creation and just runs the same mythology that if you invest and deposit money in black banks, black banks can invest in the community. The community can invest in businesses. The business can hire black people. Black people can have jobs and the, the community can do well. Well, for a number of reasons, you know, longer than I have time to explain here, you know, uh, um, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, and one of the bigger points that I learned from Marissa Baradaran's book is that that banks don't make money off of deposits. Uh, they, you know, bank deposits cost bank money because they have to service them with with interest and the cost of even the employees having to run all the paperwork or digital whatever versions of the paperwork. All that costs banks money. They make money off of investments and returns, and there is none of that in in uh, coming from black businesses. Uh, um, Hopefully we can even talk about a, a report I was uh, a small part of that just came out the other day on the on uh, black the state of black businesses. It talks even more about this again, where black businesses have been denied access to capital from day one on the basis of any everything other than the business model or the 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 uh, the entrepreneurial uh, genius of the communities it has almost everything to do with with uh, relationships and racism and 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 you know all you know you know capitalism just in general it just you know um so anyway uh uh so all that to say that when you know when when you know mike started doing the the greenwood bank and getting a lot of popular attention for it as not only uh, just a, a nice thing to do but as an example again of how black people can use the system to overturn it and, and overcome it um it, it raised you know my attention and then uh over some some series series of attempts to engage him 
through intermediaries or whatever, and even seeing him on Instagram, you know, you know, saying he's read my book or reading my book or appreciates my book or all this other stuff. Uh, um, he more recently came out on Twitter and said, you know, what I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but something kind of egregious, you know, um, uh, I think falsely misrepresenting Garvey in black capitalism, uh, but juxtaposing it in a negative way against Fred Hampton and socialism, uh, all of which I thought was a problem and just, you know, tried to engage on that basis. Long story short, he got my number. I gave him my number. He asked for my number. I gave him my number. I invited him on my show. He didn't want to do that. We had a private conversation on the phone. I don't think it went well. He misrepresented mm -hmm. it publicly. Uh, and I let him know that. Huh? He said he wants you to be his mentor, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, he did say that. But again, so, so, but that was all sort of disingenuous. And I think part of, um, you know, I think a routine actually that he he engages in to to uh, disarm critics on his left privately, uh, so that he can publicly continue to do what he's doing without you know criticism. So it's, it's but, really you know. it's really interesting. I'm seeing what people are writing here about Killer Mike, and I work so I tour as a musician, uh, Professor Ball, and I also uh, before the world shut down worked at very large music festivals um, around the country and. And I did get to meet Killer Mike once, and uh, decent good cat, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you talked to him on the phone, right? Decent cat. He's, uh, but white people really love him. Mm -hmm. Like he was, he headlined this one festival I was at in Austin, where they were maybe one of two or three rap acts, and it was a decent sized festival. It was probably like fifty or so thousand people, um, and just love this dude so it's interesting that there's a small bit of pushback that i'm seeing him get and it, and it in the grand scheme of things it's a small bit of pushback because it really doesn't echo out into the world that he really exists in right when you're getting your own netflix show mm -hmm. you know a few people that give you the finger on twitter isn't stopping that cash flow um, because I think of the way that he is viewed from his music, which is so interesting. I think people look at his music as revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, how do you even view his music? Or has it changed? <laughs> has that well, even I, changed since the exchange? Honestly, I, it, no, it didn't change. I mean, I, this is not, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I, he was just never in my, like, I was like, oh, he's talented. He, I've heard him on a few tracks, uh, particularly when he you know popped up on Outcast or here or there. Something. Yeah. He was never my, you know, people used to send me like, you know, run the jewels. Like when the, like when the video and stuff would come out that for some years ago, some video came out that seemed to, and people, you know, students in particular would ask me, you know, what do you think? And 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 I and I would listen and I was like, it's pretty good, but it's not revolutionary. Like, because there was the assumption that there was something political that I would be appealing, find appealing. And I was like, it's not really, it's not revolutionary. It's, I mean, anyway, I think he's a good MC. He's just not, you know, in my, you know. I get it. Uh, you know, so it didn't it. change one way or another. Uh, but to me, but, but, but sort of to your point and to the point of what I was trying to get to him with on the phone was that in terms of this mentor thing, it was that we didn't learn anything about each other in that phone call. That was at least, at least, well, I can speculate on what I think I learned about him, but he didn't learn anything about me. Uh, we didn't, there wasn't much learning going on. That's what I was saying. Like it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a fruitful conversation. And it, so I was like, that's why I was saying, you know, uh, uh, and I was, again, I'm trying to figure out and I'm trying to honestly assess, are you being serious and we can build or are you, you trying to hustle me so that you, so I, I you're you know, cover you're running cover for yeah. it, but but really, <laughs> but really my my only point is is that I'm not, I don't expect him or anyone else or myself or anyone to get everything right, and I don't. My only issue, my biggest issue, is I was trying to say to him, the only reason I reached out was that you are misrepresenting non-revolutionary behavior as revolutionary behavior. That's the only thing, really. The only thing actually left in this world that really can, can, you know, you know, push buttons or whatever with me is when is when people do that. I don't like it. Um, we don't. We we all have lanes. We all have politics. We all have points of interest. I get it. Some people don't want to take on certain issues. Some people don't want to take on certain, you know, ideas publicly. Whatever. That's fine. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, you know, I have a different judgment of all of that. It's when people step out. 
and make claims about what they're doing that I think uh, can be, you know, demonstrated as not that. And if, you know, and I always point to, you know, my, my you know, uh, you know, uh, you talk about mentors or Jegnas, you know, you know, the late Ron Walters for me did this in the ideal way. Politically, he was no, nowhere where I want us to be, but he was always very clear about that. So, he, and he was always saying, look, this is where my lane is. I'm not going to, you know, uh, throw shade on your lane. I'm just going to acknowledge I'm not a radical. I'm not a revolutionary. I'm a sort of, you know, liberal, you know, whatever, whatever he would describe himself as. Um, but he never, he never stepped out there and said, look, what I'm advocating is revolutionary, uh, activity or a revolutionary solution. Um, he, he never pointed, stepped out there as I'm trying to lead a, a black radical movement or a radical movement or a youth, you know, so that's the kind of, anyway, that's the kind of thing I was trying to get at. Like I, I, if, it, uh, um, and then the other thing I, you know, if you're going to go on New York Times podcasts and and Puffy's, you know, uh, panels and and tell everybody, you know, you're from the hood and therefore, you know, you know, and you have a certain experience that shouldn't be criticized by people who don't have that experience, then you should have that same level of respect for political struggle, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't your lane, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, those of us who've been doing this. You know, you you should talk to us at least at least as much as you talk to Puffy and Candace Owens and New York Times and whoever else, regardless of how much money you're being paid or 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 whoever is setting this up for you. Um, so that's also kind of another little pet peeve of mine that you know you, you why wouldn't you come on my little platform if you're so concerned about the people? Well, because you don't have enough yeah. followers for him to care okay. about. Okay. Right? I well, mean, let's just be honest but then, why a lot of people don't want to fuck. I, I, and I'm not that. saying that like as a slight to you. I'm saying it more as a slight to the people that don't go on your show. No, I but I get that. But and and that's that makes perfect sense for people who want to promote themselves to do other things. But if you're trying to claim you're working for the people and with the people and did the did the did the da, um, then I think that you should. Uh, because if you're trying to build a black radical movement, the New York Times podcast is not. That's not who's listening to that. <laughs> I. Because that shit, that's the kind of shit that pisses me off to no end, right? Like mm -hmm. some of the people that have bothered to come on this show when no one was listening. You know, Gerald Horde came on here when I didn't really have too many people listening. Mm -hmm. Right? And I, I always, even though I may not agree with everything these cats say, I got to at least give them props that they're like, look, I'm trying to I'm, see this brother trying to build something. Let me help him out mm -hmm. and build something. So it's like, oh, wow, that's Killer Mike, not that guy. You know, I, you know, what can I say? But the more important thing is that I just, is, is that black banking is not a solution to black inequality. So that, that was, you know, whatever we are politically, personally, whatever, that point I think is, is what most needs to be addressed. Which is why I really enjoyed the opening of your book when you're really calling out Jay Z in that song. The uh, what was it called? The What of OJ? The story of OJ. Story of OJ. Sorry, sorry. Um, because you know, for a lot of cats, that language is the end all be all of why we are where we are. Right? We just we need to just work a little bit harder. We don't have the financial uh, education, financial literacy if you will. Mm -hmm. I'd like you, Jared, to really elaborate on your thoughts about the way uh, Black popular cultural producers are used to kind of cynically promote these, uh, you know, pro-capitalist talking points in the name of Black unity that is not original, as you know, that goes back a long time, particularly with the Nixon Black capitalism, and has been used by every presidential administration. Like, what exactly are your thoughts on the way in which Black popular cultural figures are used to circulate these kind of kind of you know traditional current conservative mainstream mechanisms of of supported supposed black empowerment in the name of quote unquote racial unity and you know you know racial uplift. Well, I mean, you know, his birthday just passed uh, uh, last week, but you know, um, uh, Paul Robeson is a great example of you know what happens when. Uh, you know, black or any really any other, um, you know, a celebrity attempts to use their celebrity to address the conditions of their community. Uh, they end up being targeted by MK Ultra, 
and, and, and you know, uh, their career and their mind and, and body destroyed uh, and their memory and their legacy, for that matter, destroyed. Uh, so, you know, Jay-Z has been very clear throughout his whole career that he is a, a businessman business and a businessman. Man. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's been very clear and I, and I've, I've been a fan, you know, I, you know, up until the black album, that was, you know, where we parted ways after that, I, that album I loved. And then after that, we parted ways. He was my biggest contradiction musically. Um, but he's always been very clear. You know, I was, you know, drinking platinum when you thought it was, uh, you know, beer and I was, you know, you know all of that stuff mm -hmm. or drinking, drinking crystal when you thought it was beer, rocking platinum when you thought it was silver and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So he's always been very clear what his, you know, I, I wanted to, I, I could rhyme like Talib Kweli, but I don't want to, cause I want to get paid. I don't, I, I don't want the roots money or something like that. As he said, you know, uh, <laughs> at least that, that pre Jimmy Fallon roots money. I bet that Jimmy Fallon money is pretty I I mean, pretty, Jimmy Fallon money is pretty consistent, but I, would I bet say that's that pretty good playing a stadium. No doubt is probably. Way no doubt. Than I'm just roots. saying I'm just saying, though. But when he was talking about the roots money, he was talking about pre Fallon money. That's what I'm saying. He's I can, like, you know, you want to know real stories about the roots post Fallon? Sure. It's not that much. Oh, they don't. They honestly don't fill the size of rooms you would think they would fill or even play. And I don't know if that has more to do with management or their ability to draw at this point, because it's kind of the downside of being on a show like Fallon is whatever your base was mm -hmm. in the nineties, it ain't following you on Fallon. So you have a new base. So you're playing a, a totally different show. That makes sense. Um, I, you know, it makes sense. Uh, um, they they bamboozled themselves. I mean, we you know they 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 literally became the caricature that they portrayed and bamboozled. So it's <laughs> it's it's I, you know it's unfortunate. I you know what what can I say? But but uh, um, uh, but anyway. But 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 to that point, you know, look. Uh, and even I try to even I make some of the reference in, in the book to some of this work. But, you know, the, whatever we think of these artists, uh, and this is something I've been looking at for a long time, too, as as, as I know many others. But, um, you, you know, fame is political. Celebrity is political. So nobody uh, again, you cannot be rich, famous and radical regardless of your background. And I think there are zero exceptions to this historically where anyone of any background is rich, famous and politically radical and sustains themselves in that situation. I mean, I, I, I'm unaware of any exception to that rule. Actually, I'm not aware of Susan any. Sarandon. Like I said, nobody is rich, famous and politically radical and sustains Borat. themselves as all of that. I mean, either you lose your wealth, your your fame or your politics. Uh, I, you know, I don't know that she's, I don't know, I don't consider I'm her politically totally radical. Totally no, I know you are, but I'm just saying, <laughs> but I'm just saying that, 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 uh, no, I, I know you are, but I'm just saying that, 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 um, uh, uh, but I was about to say was that even to the extent that she, she, wherever she is, I do think her career has suffered because she is perceived as being left of what even is acceptable in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, anyway, but, um, but again, so so even without uh, um, getting to the documents or the the evidence that that shows the overt uh, intent to use celebrity for uh, certain political uh, machinations, there is the unspoken reality that artists realize uh, as they're coming up that if you want certain levels of of, of fame, again, Jay Z, I think, admitted this, uh, you know, on, you know, very well. Uh, that if you want certain levels of access, you you have to take certain positions. And and I and I, if I'm not mistaken, he also warned Kanye West after that comment years ago uh, about George Bush hates black people. That uh, it was Jay Z that pulled Kanye aside and, and basically said, you know, if, if if you know, okay, you got that one line in, but you know, you know, uh, you cannot consistently stay in that same direction and expect your career to continue to go up and up. Uh, you, you know, you better get your, you know, so in any way, but, but really in the point I've made, to, you know, to my students all the time is that the, the celebrity only exists to be on, on hand to play a particular uh, political role when necessary. Mm -hmm. So Jay-Z's career was, has really only been sustained so that he would be here to say uh, that Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee is passe and we need to move into black ownership. Uh, you know, Snoop's career is only, 
you know, is sustained so that he could say Kaepernick is, you know, is, um, you know, silly or whatever. And we need to go back to, you know, um, you know, smoking weed and doing beer commercials with Martha, Martha Stewart. You know, that's that's if they're not playing that that role. Mm -hmm. talent notwithstanding their mm -hmm. fame is going to go away i mean they can find other talented artists um uh or less talented artists even to do the same thing in terms of playing the pop cultural you know role so anyway uh but art is here uh, media again going back to levine's point media are here for psychological counterinsurgency purposes not here to entertain to to give news or or inform or whatever so uh uh, uh um, all of it is being used to suppress radical tendencies uh in the guise of selling us entertainment or or clothing or drinks or cars or whatever all of that is the the overt that's the distraction that's the that's the in, in the wormwood documentary that's the that's the claim that someone took LSD as a CIA experiment and jumped out of a window so that you can hide the fact that you threw him out of the window because he was going to expose the fact that you were engaged in chemical biological warfare. Mm -hmm. That's the kind, that's a, sort of where I'm trying to, where at least where I'm trying to go in my own uh, analysis or interpretation of it all so that, that to, to understand, so we can move past all of these discussions. Well, didn't you like the show? Don't you watch those movies? Jared, don't you listen to some, some horrifically anti whatever human music yeah. from time to time? Of course I do, yeah. but I, I'm a, but that's irrelevant. Uh, what I think of it, what, what you think of it, what, what, what I think of its impact on me is all irrelevant. The intent from those producing it and creating this environment is that it be for counterinsurgency anti-colonial, you know, colonial, uh, anti, uh, uh, well, counterinsurgency suppression uh, and psychological warfare. That's why it's here. Um, anyway. and, and, and Jason thinks I'm cynical about popular culture. I've been saying this I, forever. I, I watch popular culture for the reasons, but you can relate it to, to real shit, right? Like uh, we had a guest on recently who wrote, I don't know if you're a fan of Star Wars movies at all. I don't know about a fan, but I mean, I watched at least the first run as a kid. Well, know. this show is over. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen uh, enough. Uh, he wrote a book actually uh, using Star Wars as a grand narrative for the left. Mm. And, it's a, and, he, and he uses all 11 movies. Oh, damn. Like he really gets into it about like, okay, well, why does the Death Star come back then if you blow it up? And he's like, well, because the Republic never addressed the inequalities that happened in the Outer Rim. I mean, remember, there's slavery and all those. It's an interesting book, right? Wow. And he's got a new book out about capitalism's decline using the Hunger Games as, as the same narrative. So that's why I like certain aspects of pop culture recently we had a movie night for our patrons pascal suggested a movie that actually really blew me away uh the or the original the spook who sat by the door right on because because uh, you know lee daniels isn't going to remake it correctly no no so so you might as well see the original we uh, watched the original and 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 i had never seen the movie before i'm not gonna mm. lie and thinking about when it came out right this comes out during nixon's america Mm -hmm. This comes out also during the era of these quote unquote black exploitation movies, literally saving the Hollywood studios. So they're just pumping shit out. Uh, and none of it was to the level of this film. <laughs> and right. I don't think, and I don't think if I remember the story correctly, I don't think any of it was shot quote unquote legally either. I think it was all gorilla done. I don't think they had one permit for one oh, scene yeah. in that movie. <laughs> I would believe that. I would totally. So I love. That. I love that. I hope that's true because I, I would love that. I love that that version of of it because uh, you know I think that it adds to the the mystique. Um, Jared, I do have. To, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, we're coming up on an hour, but what we usually do is after the hour we have a patrons only section we go to. So I have one question I want to ask you before we go there. But we'd okay. like to know: Would you be willing to go to our patrons only next? hour or so and do some more time or do you are you have time constraints i'm up way past my bedtime i don't i i, I don't think i can i don't think i should promise an hour uh because i'm i'm fading fast as we speak but um yeah i'll try to hold on for a few minutes at least you know 
But, but I want to ask right. you this last question because this is okay. a common question, and this is, this is I want you I want you to address this. Uh, what do you say to those who argue that other ethnic groups like the Irish, the Italians, the Asians, the Arabs, the Indians, etc., are able to come to America and open businesses, some even in black communities, and improve their condition? So what is, quote, unquote, wrong with black people that they can't do the same? So why does so-called so capitalism work for them, but it doesn't work for black America? So again, well, the first part is, and I and I don't say this directly in in the book, but the first part of it is, is that that's just anti-black, you know, white supremacist, colonial mythology, racism, right there. Uh, so the first thing is that anybody who would look at black people in this country and say that they haven't done what other groups have been able to do uh, should check themselves already at where they, where what they think of either themselves as black people or what they think of black people as non-black people, because uh, that's it's it's so it's 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 fantasy and garbage nobody has worked harder in this country than 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 the the enslaved and the, the their descendants in this country and no, and none of them uh you know have been more exploited that said uh the the simple answer to this the specifics is that every other group a that is seen to be doing all of that so-called you know uh advancing work here is doing it as a result of public policy uh, that often includes relationships with their home countries and governments or special deals that go back, you know, 100 years with the, with the federal government here, uh, particularly, for instance, with the Chinese about moderating how many people could come here and, and mandating that the only Chinese that could come here would be those setting up businesses, which had support from from uh, Chinese governments. Uh, you know, so so I mean, that's part of it. Um, the other part of it is that is also part of the mythology is that all of the communities and countries from which these people come are no better off and are not closing gaps in inequality themselves. So, so the people we see, for, I always point to the one not far from you know my corner store here, so to speak, even in the suburbs of Maryland, has a has a the corner store near my house has a, the same uh, uh, East Indian family uh, working in it. Uh, East Asian, I should say, family in it, working in it uh, every time you go in there, the same five, six, seven people in there. So you could say, yeah, they own it uh, and not and black people don't own it. But but what is the condition of their family or their community? What public policy was there to, to help them get set up? Uh, and what working relationship or situation are, or do they have that we would want to emulate? I damn sure don't want a situation where I, me and my five relatives got to be in there 24 <laughs> seven, you know, uh, uh, to sustain probably several hundred other people in our family elsewhere, uh, um, and at the expense of other people here. So the, the, the last point of the course is, is that not only is this public policy, but this is all about, you know, you know, uh, subdividing. The planet, as imperialism does, and pitting everybody against one another, uh, and it's all you know some nonsense. So um, yeah, that's as short as I can I can do it. And also, it's basically a lie because most of the, when you're talking about policy, particularly those white ethnics were lifted out of poverty largely because of the New Deal and government largesse that's right. that was structurally not even really allocated to blacks because of the way they were basically pitted to being domestic sharecropper labor and not receive those benefits to the same extent. So uh, it's a complete right. total fallacy. Right on. But uh, Jason, you want to take it from here? You know, we're at the hour point. Well, we're, we're at the hour mark. Uh, and I know it's late in Maryland. It is 10 o'clock. Yeah. Which for um, me is way late. late. It's late for me too, but you don't give a damn at all because you be want to have me. I'm kind of a douche. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm not gonna. There's certain things I'll lie about. I will not lie about my douchenicity. <laughs> uh, I will ask nicely mm -hmm. if we could even get 20 minutes of sure. your, of yeah, your yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I no, we appreciate it, brother. Shit. I mean, people mm -hmm. pay us to get black people on after hours, so we curse. <laughs> <laughs> man I, I i tell people man i i have been uh something that kwame Ture said also there's two things one related to capitalism one he said capitalism makes us think we're thinking when we're merely reacting to stimuli 
And the other thing he once said was that we're not supposed to cuss when we do our public work because uh, uh, that's white bourgeois liberalism that we're mimicking and, and, and our communities don't deserve that. And I've, and I've always gone back and forth with that. But, but between that and doing just public radio uh, for so many years back in the day, I've just sort of trained myself. We're also teaching in the classroom. Uh, for the most part, I trained myself to not uh, cuss when I'm, I'm uh, in a somewhat public setting. So anyway, that's all. Yeah, we missed that training. I, yeah, hey, horrible at it. I hear horrible you. No, no judgment. I just just ex explanation why you don't hear me cussing like I do when I'm off off air. Well, thank you for your time, uh, Professor Ball. There is a link to his book, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power, in the description of the show. There's also a link to Black Power Media and his show, I Mix What I Like. Please check it out. Subscribe if you can, become a patron. How often are you on? I don't know, man. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm supposed to be trying to do it once a week, but I just, whenever, whenever we, whenever I have time, whenever a guest has time, we, we. Oh, we, yes. We, well, I, one of the questions I had that we can't, we ran out of time was for you to talk about your Black Power Media uh, conglomerate. But since we don't have the time, please support Black Power Media. Jared Ball is a conglomerate of black leftists trying to address the issues of you know black people and working class people from a radical left perspective uh, and uh, support them on YouTube. I believe that they're trying to develop into a podcast. But we, we, we'll give you some time in the uh, patrons only section to talk about that development and what you guys are trying to achieve. Sure, sure. Thank you. And please support these black people and become a patron and their power media <laughs> and their power <laughs> yeah <laughs> right because again everybody we're getting pascal some new lighting no oh, here we go <laughs> that's the whole goal it's going to be some fire lighting because we got to get better lighting than and the, and the microphone too got to get a microphone get a, the, the microphone you, I you deserve to sound mic. better than that. He's, he's got he's got he's got that. one of those podcast microphones. This is a this is a SM. This is a Shure. Well, I got I just got put onto this one. I don't. I actually can't hear. I hope I'm sounding as good as I hope yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but, but uh, uh, brother Q from the Drop Squad put me onto this mic. Uh, the um, Audio Technica, which is this is just a simple. No, this is a vocal mic that you would have oh, at the yeah. show. Oh, right on, right on. Keeping it, keeping. I'm it right here. Y'all can hear me. Stop fronting. <laughs> we, hear, we, we hear you it's just it's audio files sometimes you know get bougie with the with the oh, sound oh don't okay so all right we we're at an hour <laughs> all right I'm, I'm gonna hit you with the new link to the new to the new all side right. you guys if you're patrons i already got the link up uh so. to the patron only after hours thank you dr ball thank you guys for paying attention i'm going to leave you with a little bit of kwame Ture, and we're out oh, i'm sorry i'm gonna leave you with some selling the negro